So welcome again. Um, I know we haven't um, seen each other since last Tuesday because we didn't have class on Friday, which again will be the same this week. So just a heads up. Um, so it seems like a while. If you were following along, I did though send out an email and put an announcement on Summit as to what the assignment was for over the weekend. Um, didn't see a lot of people get that turned in, unfortunately. And progress reports coming out tomorrow, so I want to give everybody, um, you know, one more opportunity today to try and work on that checkpoint and uh, get it completed. Okay. So the checkpoint we are talking about is on Summit, all right, under our class Creative Writing Term Four. Checkpoint is called what, or this project is what is love, and I'm talking about checkpoint two right here. Right, it says reading journal my life with the wave. Okay. So when you click the link in the box right here, it'll take you to the checkpoint, which looks like this. All right. And you can also on Summit, if you're on the checkpoint, scroll down and you'll see under resources, it says my life with the wave text. You can click that and it'll, you can access the story that way too, all right? Now, what we've been talking about regarding this checkpoint is um, allegory, which is, like we said in class, a type of story that uses um, a symbol. So maybe it's an object or an animal um, or a place, right? To kind of represent a bigger idea, represent a bigger theme or message. Um, so we're kind of, you know, telling a bigger story within a smaller story represented through whatever that symbol may be. We said some examples of this might be, you know, if you've heard of Moby Dick, or, you know, the whale or Life of Pi with the tiger right? or Animal Farm with, you know, the different animals on the farm being the symbols um, of different people throughout history. So that's what an allegory is. And because again, this whole project is about, you know, what are the different ways, what are the different tools authors use to write about love and their thoughts, their thoughts and feelings about love. And an allegory is one of the ways we can do that. So this short story that I have shared on my screen right here, My Life with the Wave, is a great example of an allegory, okay? We can tell by the title, um, the symbol is probably going to be the ocean wave, right? So what you're doing on the checkpoint, right, is pretty simple. There's just two parts. Computer did. What's up? Computer did. Do you have a question, Gianni? No. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't know I was off the mute. You're good. Happens to the best of us. Um, so all you're doing here in the checkpoint is just two parts. Part one, simple matching. So you have the element or the definition of something from the story over here. You're matching it with the corresponding letter that you find in the box down here. So for example, the first one, oh, oh, oh excuse me, I was fighting off a yawn. Hey, Shad, good morning, welcome. So we are just going over um, how to do checkpoint two in Summit, since that is what is due for progress reports. So this is what I'm going to need um, from everyone by the end of the day today. These progress reports are coming out tomorrow. So you can find it in Summit um, under our class Creative Writing Term Four Checkpoint Two, right here. When you're clicking the link in this box, okay. But again, first part of the checkpoint, simple matching. So you have the, the element from the story over here and matches the corresponding letter you know, down here. So like the first one is Octavio Paz. So I go down here to the key and I'd see which one of these closest, you know, is the closest match to what or who Octavio Paz is. And I would put that letter on the line right here. You can just type the letter in there, okay? That's part one, very easy. Part two, also not super difficult, just some open-ended questions. 
but I'm looking for these to be in complete sentences in your own words. All right, should have at least two or you know two or three sentences for each answer. Okay, and all of these, um, you know, you will get from reading the story, which we're going to do, you know, right now, one more time. All right, there are also some class recordings on YouTube um, that you'll be able to watch in addition to this one when I put it up later today, where I'm going over the story as well. So those will be a big help. Okay. Questions so far about any of that, about where the checkpoint is, what you're doing, any issues with Summit, anything like that. If you have questions, now's the time to ask them. Yeah, everybody's good. All right, cool. So then, like I said, what we are going to do uh, the rest of our time this morning is go through the story, and um, we'll stop talk about it in a couple space, couple places, so we can kind of understand what's going on. And the big question we want to keep in the back of our minds as we read is, you know, what is this wave? you know, supposed to represent? What is it supposed to symbolize? Because, you know, if it's if the story is an allegory, that's what, that's what, you know, allegories do is they use, you know, some kind of symbol to represent a bigger theme, a bigger, bigger issue, bigger picture. So we'll be keeping that in the back of our minds as we read, all right? So like I said, uh, you can access the story from Summit if you want to have it open on your end and follow along, you can go to checkpoint two right here, like I am now. You can scroll down till you see life with the wave text. Oh, 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 excuse me. And if you click that, it'll bring you to the link with the story. All right. I will also be sharing it on my screen as I read. So you can follow along that way. Okay. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna turn my music down a tad. All right, so again, as we're reading, keep in the back of our head, you know, what is this wave, you know, symbolizing? Right. When I left the sea, a wave moved ahead of the others. She was tall and light. In spite of the shouts of the others who grabbed her by her floating skirts, she clutched my arm and went leaping off with me. I didn't want to say anything to her because it hurt me to shame her in front of her friends. Besides, the furious stares of the larger waves paralyzed me. When we got to town, I explained to her that it was impossible, that life in the city was not what she had been able to imagine with all the ingenuousness of a wave that had never left the sea. She watched me gravely. No, her decision was made. She couldn't go back. I tried sweetness, harshness, irony, she cried, screamed, hugged, threatened. I had to apologize. Okay. So stopping there, just from that first paragraph alone, what do we notice about the way the author is talking about describing the wave? Is he talking about the wave like it's just an uh, ocean wave? Or is he talking about it more like it's an actual person? What do you think? Yeah, I agree, Ma. Like it's an actual person. Does anybody remember the word we use, the type of figurative language literary device that you know doing that is called giving human traits or characteristics to something that's not human, you know, like an object or an animal or something like that? There's a word we use to describe that. It starts with a P. Anybody who has a thought? All 
Do you remember what that's called when we give human or <clears throat> people like characteristics to things that aren't people? It's a certain word we use, a certain type of figurative language. So what is that word called? It starts with a P and it means, you know, you're giving human like qualities or traits to something that's not human. It's a type of figure which that we use. Do we remember what that word is? Mod's not sure. Anybody else with a thought? Shadi, I know I've had you in class before. We've definitely talked about this word. My other hint is there's a smaller word in the the whole word itself that kind of gives us a hint that, oh, this is something that has to do with people or giving people like traits to something that's not a person. Anybody else with a thought? Gianni, Shamir? Yes, Ahmad, personification is correct. Good job, good job. And the way I remember that, again, like I said, that little hint is personification, person, you know, there's, you know, that small word in the bigger word. So that's my hint that like, okay, I know this is what we do to make something that's not a person act like a person, personification. So that's what he's doing right here in this first paragraph. He's personifying the wave, making it seem like it's an actual person. And so again, that should give us a clue as to, you know, that bigger, that bigger question, that bigger picture, what is this wave supposed to represent? Okay. What is it symbolizing? So we'll keep going here. Good job though. The next day my troubles began. How could we get on the train without being seen by the conductor, the passengers, the police? It's true. The rules say nothing in respect to the transport of waves on the railroad, but this very reserve was an indication of the severity with which our act would be judged. Oh, 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 excuse me. After much thought, I arrived at the station an hour before departure, took my seat, and, when no one was looking, emptied the tank of the drinking fountain. Then, carefully, I poured in my friend. The first incident arose when the children of a nearby uh, couple loudly declared their thirst. I blocked their way and promised them refreshments and lemonade. They were at the verge of accepting when another angry, another thirsty passenger approached. I was about to invite her too, but the stare of her companion stopped me short. The lady took a paper cup, approached the tank, and turned the faucet. Her cup was barely half full when I leaped between the woman and my friend. She looked at me in astonishment. While I apologized, one of the children turned the faucet again. I closed it violently. The lady brought the cup to her lips. Ah, this water is salty. Again, it's a wave from the ocean, right? So it's going to be salt water. The boy echoed her. Various passengers rose. The husband called the conductor. This man put salt in the water. The conductor called the inspector. So you place substances in the water? The inspector called the police. So you poison the water? The police in turn called the captain. So you're the poisoner? The captain called three agents. The agents took me to an empty car amidst the stares and whispers of the passengers. At the next station, they took me off and pushed and dragged me to jail. For days, no one spoke to me except during the long interrogations. No one believed me when I explained my story, not even the jailer who shook his head saying, the case is grave, truly grave. You weren't trying to poison children? One day, they brought me before the magistrate. Your case is difficult, he repeated. I will assign you to the penal judge. A year passed. Finally, they tried me. As there were no victims, my sentence was light. After a short time, my day of freedom arrived. The warden called me in. Well, now you're free. You were lucky. Lucky there were no victims. But don't let it happen again, because the next time you'll really pay for it. And he stared at me with the same solemn stare with which 
everyone watched me. The same afternoon, I took the train and after hours of uncomfortable traveling, arrived in Mexico City. I took a cab home. The door of my apartment, I heard laughter and singing. I felt a pain in my chest, like the smack of a wave of surprise when surprise smacks us in the chest. My friend was there, singing and laughing as always. How did you get back? Easy, on the train. Someone, after making sure that I was only salt water, poured me into the engine. It was a rough trip. Soon I was a white plume of vapor. Then I, I fell in a fine rain on the machine. I thinned out a lot. I lost many drops. Her presence changed my life. So this part here, we're going to start to see, you know, how uh, living with the wave affects him and kind of, you know, what, you know, this might be similar to and what, you know, it's trying to represent. Her presence changed my life. The house of dark corridors and dusty furniture was filled with air, with sun, with green and blue reflections, a numerous and happy populace of reverberations and echoes. How many waves one wave is and how it can, how it can create a beach. Uh, let's just check in here. How it can create a beach or rock or jetty out of a wall, a chest, a forehead that it crowns with foam. Even the abandoned corners, the abject corners of dust and debris were touched by her light hands. Everything began to laugh and everywhere white teeth shone. The sun entered the old rooms with pleasure and stayed for hours when it should have left the other houses. The district, the city, the country, and some nights very late, the scandalized stars would watch it sneak out of my house. Love was a game, a perpetual creation. Everything was beach, sand, a bed with sheets that were always fresh. If I embraced her, she would swell with pride, incredibly tall, like the liquid stock of a poplar. And soon that thinness would flower into a fountain of white feathers, into a plume of laughs that fell over my head and back and covered me with whiteness or she would stretch out in front of me, infinite as the horizon, until I too became horizon and silence. Full and sinuous, she would envelop me like music or some giant lips. Her presence was a going and coming of caresses, of murmurs, of kisses. Plunging into her waters, I would be drenched to the socks and then, in the wink of an eye, find myself high above at a dizzying height, mysteriously suspended to fall like a stone and feel myself gently deposited on dry land like a feather. Nothing is comparable to sleeping in those waters, unless it is waking pounded by a thousand happy light lashes, by a thousand assaults that withdraw laughing. So if we stop there, up to this point, so how does his relationship with the wave seem so far, you know, that they're living together? Does it seem like they're happy right now, or does it seem like they're kind of in a bad place what does, has it seemed to you guys up to this point i know ahmad's been killing it so maybe let's try and hear from somebody else if we can gianni shoddy type if you're out there does it seem like him and the wave are happy at this point or not doing so well what do you guys think Yeah, you're right, Ahmad. It does seem like they're happy. We can tell here by some of the language, you know, that he uses, like right here, you know. Uh, Foolish City was, she would envelop me like music or some giant lips. Her presence was a, uh, going and coming of crests of murmurs of kisses. And then when we look, you know, this page up here, and he says, um, you know, the dark, the house of dark corridors and dusty furniture was filled with air, with sun, with green and blue reflections. So, you know, we think, what is this, you know, what is this similar to? What does this seem like, you know, in real life? You know, think about when you, you know, are single and you're by yourself, you're a little bit depressed, and then you meet somebody new. You have a new partner, new boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is. Um, 
now you're really happy. It's almost in like that honeymoon phase, right? So that's what he's saying. Like, you know, the dark parts of my house were suddenly filled with light. Everything is joy and laughter and happiness. And, you know, he's kind of using that metaphor of like, you know, the sun is staying in the house, you know, past sunrise and the stars are getting jealous because, you know, there's so much joy and happiness going on here. So definitely, you know, a happy relationship. But we'll see if that's about to change. Because remember, you know, uh, you know, it's a wave, not an actual human person. So maybe having a relationship with a wave will, you know, prove more difficult. And so we'll see him start to, to talk about that here. But I never reached the center of her being. I never touched the nakedness of pain and death. Perhaps it does not exist in waves. The secret place that renders a woman vulnerable and mortal. Uh, that electric button where everything interlocks. Uh, sorry. Everything interlocks, twitches, uh, straightens out, and then swoons. Her sensibility, like that of women, uh, spread in ripples. Only they weren't concentric ripples, but rather eccentric ones that spread further each time. Spread further each time until they touched uh, other galaxies. To love her was to um, extend to remote contracts, to vibrate with far off stars we never suspect. But her center, no, she had no center, just an emptiness, like a whirlwind that sucked me in and smothered me. So he's realizing here that, you know, while, you know, it's great and they're happy, she's still, you know, a little bit kind of, uh, kind of empty inside because she's still just a wave, not an actual human uh, person. But think, you know, again, about what this might symbolize if you're with a partner and you start to realize, like, maybe they're a little cold, maybe they're a little distant, they're not, you know, quite what I expected or, or imagined. Stretched out side by side, we exchanged confidences, whispers, smiles. Curled up, she fell on my chest and unfolded there like a vegetation of murmurs. She sang in my ear, a little seashell. She became humble and transparent, clutching my feet like a small animal, calm water. She was so clear I could read all of her thoughts. On certain nights, uh, her skin was covered with phosphorescence and to embrace her was to embrace a piece of night tattooed with fire but she also became black and bitter. At unexpected hours, she roared, moaned, twisted. Her groans woke the neighbors. Upon hearing her, the sea wind would scratch at the door of the house um, or rave in a loud voice on the roof. Cloudy days irritated her. She broke furniture, said foul words, covered me with insults and gray and greenish foam. She spat, cried, swore, prof prophesied. Subject to the moon, the stars, the influence of the light and of other worlds, she changed her moods and appearance in a way that I thought fantastic, but was as fatal as the tide. So again, thinking about in the back of our head, this big picture, what is his relationship with the wave? What's the wave representing, symbolizing? Think of how the wave is changing and now it's really moody and kind of getting angry, right? What do we, what can we relate about real life to this situation? You know, what might this represent? She began to complain of solitude. I filled the house with shells and conches, with small sailboats that in her days of fury, she shipwrecked along with the others laden with images that each night left my forehead and sunk in her ferocious or gentle whirlwinds. How many little treasures were lost in that time? but my boats and the silent song of the shells were not enough. I had to install a colony of fish in the house. It was not without jealousy that I watched them swimming in my friend, caressing her breasts, sleeping between her legs, adorning her hair with little flashes of color. Among those fish were a few particularly repulsive and ferocious ones, little tigers from the aquarium with large fixed eyes and jagged and bloodthirsty mouths. I don't know by what aberration my friend delighted in playing with them, shamelessly uh, showing them a preference whose significance I prefer to ignore. 
she passed long hours confined with those horrible creatures. <clears throat> One day, I couldn't stand it anymore. I flung open the door and threw myself on them. Agile and ghostly, they slipped between my hands while she laughed and pounded me until I fell. <clears throat> I thought I was drowning. And when I was purple and at the point of death, she deposited me on the bank and began to kiss me, saying, I don't know what things I felt uh, very weak, uh, fatigued, and humiliated. And at the same time, with her voluptuousness, made me close my eyes because her voice was sweet and she spoke to me of the deliciousness of death of the drowned. And when I came to my senses, I began to fear and hate her. So how does, stop here quick, how does the relationship between the man and the waves seem now? Does it seem like they're still, still happy, still in that honeymoon phase? Or does it seem like it's changed? And yeah, Ma, I just saw your other chat. Uh, you know, I think comparing the the wave or the water to a girl um, definitely could be could be what he's doing here. And it's definitely changing. Is it changing and getting better, or changing and getting worse? Do we think? Definitely changing and getting worse, because like he says at the end here, you know, when I came to my senses, I began to hate, to fear, and hate her. And we can see kind of that pattern that is very, you know, familiar for, you know, or, you know, very uh, recognizable if we're familiar with, you know, these types of relationships where it's kind of like, um, you know, argue and abuse, maybe even violence. And then, you know, like he said, then, you know, after the wave kind of almost drowns him, she deposits him, she kisses him, you know, he closes his eyes and, and she makes him feel loved. And it's kind of that, that vicious cycle. So we can see almost, you know, what kind of relationship has this turned into now, do we think? What's a, what's a word we could use to describe their relationship? Gianni, Shadi, Tysim, any thoughts from you guys? What's a word that we could use to describe their relationship? I'll put that in the chat as well. What do we think? What's a word that maybe we've heard before, said before, that we could use to describe a type of relationship like this? What do we think? Any thoughts out there? Gianni, Tysim, Shadi, are you guys still with us? What's a word we could use? What's one word that might describe? Hey, Naima, welcome back. <clears throat> What's one word that might describe this relationship that we that we kind of assign to relationships like this, where maybe there's one person who um, is a little bit is a little bit controlling, a little bit abusive, has a lot of mute, mood swings. Right. And now we see the, you know, the other person kind of realizes like, you know, like he says right here, when I came to my senses, I began to fear and hate her. And now they kind of realize, you know, what's going on, but yet he can't quite 
bring himself to leave. So what's a word we can use to, to describe a relationship like that? I think the word I'm thinking of starts with a T, if that is a, a hint to anybody. Kind of word would we use to describe a relationship like this? So I would say my thought would be toxic, right? This seems like it's becoming a very toxic relationship yeah you got it Ahmad just as I was kind of putting it in there too yeah I would say definitely tox definitely becoming a toxic relationship right um you know toxic for the man obviously because we can see how the wave is treating him right but think about why would it be you know why is it toxic for the wave all right does the wave feel like she you know is fine and she belongs in this guy's house or do we think she might feel like she doesn't belong there or maybe that she wants to be somewhere else. Did we kind of get that impression here? Especially if we look at this part right here, she began to complain of solitude. I filled the house with shells and conches with small sailboats in that in her days of fury, she shipwrecked, right? Uh, but my boats and the silent song of shells were not enough, right? So does it seem like the wave, you know, feels at home there or does it maybe feel like she wants to be somewhere else? What does it seem like for her? And Naima, I know you joined us a little bit late, but if you have a thought, you know, feel free to share as well. And if you missed the beginning part of the story, it'll be up on YouTube later today. But does the wave seem... Yes, I was going to ask you after the class, is it a way that you could uh, email me the passage or the book that we read in because I'm lost. Yeah, the there's a link to it right under the checkpoint on Summit. And you know, if you watch the, the class recording on YouTube later, I go over how to how to access that. So you can find it right on Summit underneath the actual checkpoint itself. There it goes. <laughs> I would have kept fumbling. Okay. Cool. All right. So I think if we're stumped on that question there, you know, we can say it's toxic for the wave because she's also a little bit homesick for the ocean, right? Because waves belong in the ocean. So that's why maybe she's kind of, um, you know, having all of these mood changes and stuff like that. So now we'll see how the author deals with it. All right. I neglected my affairs. Excuse me. Now I began to visit friends and renew old relations. Uh, I met an old girlfriend making her swear to keep my secret. I told her of my life with the wave. Nothing moves women as much as the possibility of saving a man. My uh, redeemer employed all of her arts, uh, but what uh, could what could a woman? master of a limited number of souls and bodies do, faced with my friend who was always changing and always uh, identical to herself in her incessant metamorphoses. Winter came, the sky turned gray, fog fell on the city, a frozen drizzle uh, rained. My friend screamed every night. During the day, she isolated herself, quiet and sinister, stuttering a single syllable, like an old woman who mutters in a corner. Hey, welcome back, Kanaya. She my became... phone had died, and then I had to call uh, Mr. Thompson because they said I was absent yesterday. I was not absent. He wasn't there. 
no worries. Uh, we're just kind of finished up the story here. I know you're coming in towards the end, but uh, there'll be a recording up on YouTube later today. So you can watch that to kind of get caught back up. During the day, she isolated herself, quiet and sinister, stuttering a single syllable like an old woman who mutters in a corner. She became cold. To sleep with her was to hear her all night and to feel, little by little, the blood, bones, and thoughts freeze. Hate to hear her. She turned deep, impenetrable, restless. I left frequently, and my absences were more prolonged each time. She, in her corner, endlessly cowled. With teeth like steel and a corrosive tongue, she gnawed the walls, crumbled them. She passed the nights in the morning, reproaching me. She had nightmares, deliriums of the sun, of burning beaches. She dreamt of the pole and of changing into a great block of ice, sailing beneath black skies on nights as long as months. She insulted me. She cursed and laughed, filled the house with guffaws and phantoms. She summoned blind, quick, and blunt monsters from the deep, changed, charged with electricity. She carbonized everything she touched. Full of acid, she dissolved whatever she burnt, brushed against. Her sweet arms became knotty cords that strangled me, and her body, greenish and elastic, was an implacable whip that lashed and lashed. I fled. The horrible fish laughed with their ferocious grins. So now we see the relationship's becoming so toxic, basically abusive, that now the, the author has as the man's kind of getting out of there. There in the mountains, among the tall pines and the precipices, I breathed the cold, thin air like a thought of freedom. I returned at the end of, the, at the end of a month. I had decided. It had been so cold that over the marble of the chimney, next to the extinct fire, I found a statue of ice. So now we see what's happened to the wave. It's melted, or excuse me, it's frozen and become a block of ice. I was unmoved by her wearisome beauty. I put her in a big canvas sack and went out into the streets with the sleeper on my shoulders. In a restaurant in the outskirts, I sold her to a waiter friend who immediately began to chop her into little pieces, which he carefully deposited into the buckets where bottles are chilled. Right. So we see a kind of how <clears throat> their relationship ends up there. All right, again, those of you who joined late, Obviously, you might be a little bit lost. Like I said, the class recording will be up on YouTube later today. You can go back and uh, watch me read the story from the beginning. But those of you who are with us, you know, do we have a final thought on what we think, you know, the wave, you know, is supposed to, you know, symbolize? What is this, you know, relationship? Um, let me lose here. We lost uh, Kanai again. You know, what is this, you know, relationship? you know, symbolize or represent. Ahmad, you kind of touched on this a little bit already when you said, you know, he's comparing the wave or the water to a girl. So how can we expand on that? You know, what do we think this whole relationship is supposed to symbolize? You know, are there similarities in their relationship to, you know, relationships that people have in real life? And if so, what are those similarities? Why, why does this relationship seem so familiar or so similar to ones that uh, you know, we may be familiar with in real life? What do we think? Does it, do we think this story symbolizes a healthy relationship or does it maybe symbolize, you know, a relationship that kind of has its ups and downs?
What do we think? Does this, does this relationship that started good but gradually became bad over time? Yeah, Mon, I agree. I think that's a perfect way to describe it. And so, you know, we can think about, you know, his relationship with the wave, uh, you know, kind of symbolizes somebody having that relationship in, in real life. Because, uh, you know, do you think it'd be pretty easy for somebody to read this story and relate, you know, oh, I had a partner like the wave. You know, I remember I had a relationship like this. Do we think that'd be pretty easy to do with this story? What do we think? Yes or no? I think so. Yeah, definitely. And that is why, you know, authors use allegories like this, stories that use a symbol to, to you know, paint a bigger picture or tell a, a bigger, bigger story, because it's very easy to relate to as you're reading it, um, because you can say, oh, yeah, I can see that rate, that wave represents this person that I used to date or this relationship that I used to have, right? So uh, really, really good insight there, Ahmad. Thank you. So again, ladies and gents, what you're doing um, for the checkpoint as I share my screen again here, completing checkpoint two, which is right here on Summit. Uh, Naima, to answer your question, you can also access the story right from Summit on this link right here. It says my life with the wave text, all right? And you're completing both parts, all right? Who did we lose here? Gianni looks like. All right, you're completing both parts. Part one is just matching right here. So here's your answer key and you match the letter to the corresponding element over here. And then part two, just these open-ended questions in your own words and complete sentences, okay? And we've talked about all of these um, today already, okay? So I will be looking for this by 5 p.m. today because progress reports are coming out tomorrow, all right? So I know that's kind of cutting it close, but again, we didn't meet last Friday, but I did send out an announcement and an email over the weekend, you know, with this assigned. So if you um, are able to get even the first part done, that's great because then I can at least mark you yellow for um, the progress report, okay? But that's what I'm gonna be looking for for today. Are there any questions about the checkpoint, what you need to do, where to find it, anything like that? Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. That time is for you guys to uh, get working on this. I will be here on mute if you have questions. Um, if you are not at your laptop right now and you can't work on it, um, just give me a thumbs up in the chat that you understand everything that you need to do and then you're good to go. All right, Ahmad says he's doing it now. Awesome job. All right, so Naima, Tysim, Shad, if you're able to, if you're at your laptop, now's a great time to start working on this and at least try to get a little bit done, um, like maybe that first part so that I can, you know, give you credit for the progress report, all right? Like I said, I'll be here on mute if you have questions and I'll check back in in about 10 minutes to wrap up, all right? Good job today, though. Thank you.
Hey, Brie, good morning. Um, thank you for joining us. We are just working on checkpoint two right now. We did read the story in class, um, but uh, the recording will be up on YouTube later this, later this afternoon. So if you uh, missed it, you can go back and watch there as we um, read through the story. And then we're just completing checkpoint two uh, on Summit using that story. Okay. Thank you. You are very welcome. Good to see you, though, either way. So you can also access the story on Summit as well. So if you want to use the time we have left to, um, you know, maybe start reading through it, that's fine, too. It's under checkpoint two. If you scroll down, you'll see it says, my life with the wave text. And uh, that's what you're looking for. All right, those of you who are working on this, we get about two more minutes and then we're gonna wrap up. I'm gonna take a quick pass here in Summit. Just to kind of see, Ahmad, I see you're working on yours, awesome. Uh, the rest of us, Tysim, Shadi, I see you guys haven't opened it yet. Um, and Bri, I know you just joined us. Uh, it's okay. Um, 
So again, remember that I am looking at this for the progress report, which is coming out tomorrow. So I got to see something done on this by 5 p.m. today, okay? For it to count towards progress report number two, which is coming out tomorrow, all right? So I will be looking there. I will be looking there later today. So just a heads up, we got about one minute left. So we can kind of wrap up here. So 